with the mask on, it's your choice. Except to say that sometimes it's a bit difficult talking through the mask. And the other thing is I'd like you for the record just to spell your surname so that it's properly uh, spelled when the record is reproduced. Uh, my surname is G-U-N-N-E-R. Ghana. Thank you very much. You may be seated if you wish. Yes, uh, Mr. Kasabuto. As the court faces. Good morning, Mr. Sakani. Good morning. Um, as a start, um, can you confirm that you are appearing and testifying in this court in your capacity as an expert witness? I can confirm that. <coughs> Let's Let's give the witness a chance. Looks like you want to be testified standing or seated. Um, is it possible, my lord, to stand and sit sometimes, or do I have to take one or the other? No, 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 you don't have to. Oh, uh, well, I just saw, and I thought you were battling with the arrangement. <coughs> that, that desk is not appropriate for... It's also fine if you sit and you hold it on your lap. Um, whichever you're comfortable with. I... I'll try this. It's very heavy though, so I'd prefer to have it up there. Either way. Either way. Okay. I think I'll have it up there. Yeah, and stand. Just be comfortable. You yeah. Can move your chair closer. Can you not shift that mic? It looks like it's not even working. This one on this side, not that one. The one that's not on. Maybe shift it a little bit this way so that it gives you the space. Yes, thank you very much. If you could go to page 335 of the Bible in front of you. Page 335, my lord, is the curriculum vitae of the, of the expert witness. I'm just going to go through it very quickly. It goes into 29 pages. Um, I'm going to just highlight key aspects of it, which I think of relevance and bearing in these proceedings. So page 335 is where the CV starts. I'm going to ask that you confirm what I say when I suggest that you do, Professor. It says your current appointment is a visiting professor 4.0 since October 2021 at the School of Languages faculty of Humanities, University of Johannesburg. Do you confirm that? That's correct, yes. And then if we go to paragraph three, it's your educational <coughs> qualifications. It says in 1984, you obtained a PhD in African Languages and Literature, School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. And the title was Ukubonga, is born, translated to Zulu praising and praises. You confirm that? That's correct. If you flip over the page and you go to paragraph five, it says research awards and fellowships. The very first one is Johannesburg Institute of Advanced Studies Award 2022, July, October. Writing Fellowship for Work on Book and Progress, titled The Road, The Song, and the Citizen, Migrant Music in post apartheid Oopsie, sorry, sorry, sorry. Apologies, I didn't hear you. Yes, I beg your pardon, Mr. Kasiboto, you can proceed. <clears throat> Thank you, my lord. Just in case the stenographer missed the point um, because of the interruption, I was at point five at page 336 under the topic of research awards slash fellowships. It says you obtained a Johannesburg Institute of Advanced Studies Award 2022 July October 
writing fellowship for work on book in progress titled The Road, The Song, and The Citizen, Migrant Music in Post-Apartheid South Africa. Do you confirm it? That's correct. And then there's a long list of other awards which, which I will not go through now. Well, yes. If you flip to page 338, that's paragraph, if you look at paragraph 6, headed Achievements, Public Responsibilities. The second one is Guest Editor, Journal of African Cultural Studies, open parenthesis, JACS, close bracket, 27-3-2015. Special issue on performance and social meaning in Africa. Do you confirm it? Yes. If you flip the pages again and you go to 339, under paragraph 7, titled Seminars and Papers Given at Conferences, Colloquial Workshops, which are selected. August 2015, panel organizer, violence and misreading contemporary Greek's literatures, paper, Songs of Comfort and Useful, Political <coughs> Song and the South, at Conference South Africa Beyond the West and East in Zambia, 7 to 11 August. Do you confirm it? Yes, I do. And then the list goes on and on about all these other seminars we've had, and I think we get the point. And I'll stop. Perhaps before I stop, if you go to 343, the first bullet that appears is February 2005, Zulu Choral Music, Performing Identities in Post-Apartheid South Africa, University of California, Public Lecture in Black History Month, San Diego Campus. Do you confirm that? Yes, I do. Flip the page again to 344. Under the heading publications, the second one under books single authored, you have in 1998 a handbook for teaching African literature, second edition, first edition, 1984, London, Hyman. Do you confirm that? Yes, I do. Co authored 1984, A Teacher's Guide to African Literature, HLB Moody, Liz Ghana and E. Finnegan, Bengalstoke, Macmillan. Confirm that? Yes, I do. Again, I could go on and on. Let's stop there. Now, let's go to the expert summary, which would be, and I'll tell you what the page is now. It's on page 331. For the benefit of the public and the court, what appears in page 331 is a document titled Respondents Notice in Terms of Rule 36.9b, which of course is the Uniform Rules of Court. And what that is, is a summary of the evidence that will be led by the expert witness. And if you turn to page 332, under B, you've got what we will rely on today, which are the expert's opinion, the material we will rely on. And if you go to paragraph 5, under heading B still, you have what uh, is referred to as the expert's testimony, which the professor will focus on. And I want to draw the court's attention to, to six of those. And I'm going to ask you, uh, Professor, to give a synopsis in a line or two. We want to get into the detail in due course. But in a line or two, just explain to us what each of the sub points that I will mention now mean in a line or two. And then we'll get into the substance. So if you go to paragraph 5.3. It says we're going to focus on the deeper public meaning of political song. In a sentence or two, what does that mean? 
It means that political song has a role in the public life of a state, um, particularly an African state, because of the long cultural matrix and history of politics, song, and performance in African society. And then, if you go to the next page, 333 under 5.5, the, the summary says you will give evidence on the presence of political song in South Africa's history and the context of a tradition of public performance regarding the role of song. What does that mean? Uh, it means that if you go uh, back to the start of the Union in 1910, you can trace from that time, and earlier as well, um, that there was a strong tradition of the use of public song in order to voice opinion and make important points about governance, or uh, hoped for governance. And then under 5.6, second respondents, and for the benefit of the public, the second respondent is Mr. Julius Malema. Second respondent's political vision, which foregrounded a new push on land reform and a radical economy policy. I took the, the song, and um, I was very interested in how the song operated um, as part of um, an economic policy particularly concerned with land. That was my interest in the song. And then under 5.8, the history of the song to Wooly Boom and the validity it has in the present. I, I wrote about the, um, why I thought the song had a place in the public sphere and how it operated and why it's of interest to, to myself as a cultural analyst and an analyst of language and culture and politics. And then lastly, under 5.9, the presence of political song today. I think that political song is alive in the democracy and it is being used by many different uh, elements in society to make points about life, social life, political life and change that they would like to see. I'm now going to ask you to go to page 358. What appears under page 358 is an article titled Song, Identity and the State, Julius Malema's Dubuli Boom Song as Catalyst. And it purports to have been authored by yourself. Do you confirm that? I do. You flip the page to 359. And what appears as the first paragraph, at least to me, is a synopsis of the article, and it reads, This article tracks the entry of Julius Malema and his package of skills as a political persona into the South African public domain. It focuses on his use of song, particularly the Dumuli Bunu song slash chant, within the public space and links it to a long tradition of political song. It sets this within a wider context of the aesthetics of power in the post-colony and within older epistemies of performance, language, and power. 
It also discusses the media as both actor and acted upon in relation to Malema. It links the topic of power, rhetoric, and its use to intergenerational politics and to the struggle of youth and the marginalized poor against an entrenched gerontocratic elite. That's quite a mouthful. Do you want to give us, in a sentence or two, do you want to caption what that idea is? The idea of the whole abstract? Yes. The, the idea of the whole abstract, which I trust encapsulates the paper, is that um, uh, Julius Malema began to use song, and particularly Dubli Bono, in the public sphere, but he did so knowing that it came from a long tradition of songs that went before it. And it was part of a much older bundle of meanings about language, performance, and power. And um, then I discuss how he uses it, and I link the idea of power and, and rhetoric to what I call intergenerational politics, and that is um, the politics of, say, youth and age, and how you could possibly see, you could see how what Malema was doing as an attempt to make the voice of youth hold in a situation where gerontocratic politics is very dominant in Africa. In other words, the rule by the aged. Thank you. Now, if you flip a couple of pages to page 361, And if we pay attention to the second paragraph that appears there, it's quite lengthy and I will read it nonetheless because it captures the point. At the February EFF election manifesto launch in Tembisa, and at the rally in Attridgeville, Victoria, days before the May 2014 election, song was prominent. One which was sung many times was neither new nor very old. It was a bouncy Afro-pop style song used by the ANC Youth League and by South African Students Congress organization. To, but now it was adopted by the EFF with a new subject. And the song in question goes like this. Malema Utela Tuba. Tuba El Ibona Tuba. Translated to me in English, Malema will wield the stick. The stick, do you see the stick? The beating is coming. The beating, do you see the beating coming? In the Altridgeville event, the song boomed out across the stadium with backing by DJ Chance. Those present with their EFF shirts and red berets sang along with him some miming and beating move with a flick of their hand. The final rendering was accompanied by motorbikes zooming around the track and the presence of a screen with flashing lights. This is the important part. At both rallies, as with the Lutuli moment some 60 years before, there was a sense of song uniting a gathering and being part of a moment of political defiance. The song was making a statement about the inadequacies of President Jacob Zuma and his ANC government. Its beating promised a victory to come for the EFF and a hiding for the ANC. The song, as metonym, stood for the defined presence of youth in an African gerontocracy, a recurring trope in African political song on the continent. It marked a moment of rupture with the political elite viewed as corrupt and its stale nationalist politics. Now, there are a lot of propositions that are contained there. But I want to draw your attention to ones that stuck 
out for me. And perhaps by way of contextual background, Mr. Malema, who's the subject matter, testified before this court for the past two days. When it was put to him, when a challenge was put to him to explain the meaning of the impugned song, he suggested that the EFF is a political party with a specific goal in mind, which is economic transformation, hence the name Economic Freedom Fighters. And he says he draws parallels between apartheid as we understand it in the ordinary sense, which is a governing systematic segregation of a race by the other, segregation and discrimination by the other. And then he draws an important point, which is the fulcrum of his case, which is this. Apartheid does not just take the form of what we commonly understand as apartheid. He says there is economic apartheid, which was not done away in 1994. And then he suggests that his fight for economic transformation, which includes land reformation, is not a fight targeted at a particular group per se, but at a system. Then the question is put to him, what do you mean by that? He says the system takes two forms, at least two forms. The first is this idea of land dispossession and who's liable for that. And he says that's what informs one dynamic to the impugned song. He's fighting the system where the land was dispossessed unlawfully, as he argues, from a certain demographic. And then he says, post-94, there's been a shift in that economic imbalance, particularly when it comes to the question of land. And for that reason, and I use this phrase, aluta continua, suggesting that it's myopic to suggest that apartheid as a system was dismantled in 1994. It might have been from a political prism, but it is not so from an economic prism. So for all intents and purposes, we live in an apartheid state. And when I say we, he's referring to his constituency and the people he represents. Now, that's the dynamic of the song. Because much of the debate is, is the song even relevant in contemporary South Africa, in other words, post-1994? And that's his response. Now, I want you to comment on this, having foreshadowed my question with that background. I want you to comment on this line. You say at both rallies that I've referred to, there was a sense of song uniting a gathering and being part of a moment of political defiance. What do you mean by that? I mean that you can see the song as an example of song working to pull people together to make a point about the South African present and about South African history and doing so using song as a means of defiance, an expression of defiance in a time-honored way that song has been used in South African history for the last century or more. Okay. Now, if I understand you correctly, you are suggesting that despite what might be apparent in the song, so if you hold, read the song, and I think we should do that again. It says, Malema will wield the stick. The stick, do you see the stick? The beating is coming. The beating, do you see the beating coming? Now, outside of context, you read this, at least to me, you correct me if I'm wrong, it appears there's an intention to use a stick to assault, does it not? You could read it like that, yes. Yes. 
Your explanation of the song is that it is a sense of a song to unite a gathering and being part of a moment of political defiance. So link what I've just suggested with this proposition. I think that the song is, is saying we're not going to give up. Um, don't take us lightly. And um, the stick is a metaphor for don't forget we're strong. And so it's, that's how I see it. And it's a new song. It's a song that was composed for that occasion, I believe. Yes. Oh. Oh, no, it's not. It was used before. Yes. Oh, but it's got a new subject. That's right. So he does shift it. So what he's doing is he's, he's shifting song in, in a way that, is, that happens. A song, is, a song is not necessarily static. It can move. That is very interesting. So you're suggesting that song can shift to accommodate contemporary times, but carries the same underlying idea. It carries the same underlying import of what song does yes. in the public sphere, in the public domain. Yes. That song is not simply decoration. Yes. Now, if I understand you correctly, you suggest this song was an illustration of defiance of President Jacob Zuma's and ANC's government. That's what you say. So if I understand you correctly, you say the wielding of the stick, the beating that's referred to in a song, is not a literal inference that we will literally beat up President Jacob Zuma, is it? Not at all. You could paraphrase it as saying, watch out. Yes. We're coming. And that's the underlying idea to the song. I would say so. Yes. Now, if you don't mind... Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I had to intrude. I can just ask my friend to ask me uh, open questions, not leading questions. Uh, just to be fair to the witness in the process. Thank you. I accept my little friend's uh, proposition in principle. But all I've simply done is read her own text and drew conclusions from the text as if she were testifying to her. That was the sole intention. That's the little because I have for it. But you find what I'm going to read the text and ask what is the intent. But to say, let me tell you what I think you mean. Is that what you mean? Even yes. So what we have is screen is Sorry. Excuse you. Um, may I say that people don't tell me what to say. I work it out myself. I always have. Thank you. Now, I don't know if you'd want to sit down and view the video or you're comfortable standing while the video plays. Oh, I'll sit down. Please play the video. That colonizers stole the land is them who told us. We get this from all these leaders of the ANC. Today they are in government, of course we understand they may try to be diplomatic, but you taught us that colonizers stole the land. And when you steal, you commit a criminal activity. And once you commit a criminal activity, you are a criminal, you must be treated as such. That's what we learned from them. They can disassociate with it today, we understand. Uh, they, they must be honorable in approach. But we don't have that responsibility. It's their responsibility. We say it the way it is, they must come and polish it. So that as long as the product is the same, we have no problem. Because capital has got some small mentality. Capital suffers from a mind of a wreck. They think if there's going to be an uprising, it's only the ANC which is going to be overthrown. They don't know that we'll start with them. Here in Santinia. Our people will just walk from Alexander, just across the street, open the fridge, and just mess themselves with cheese and everything else, they find nothing. Before we even 
rich, you know, building. All start here. Now, for your benefit, uh, Professor, what you saw here is the second respondent in this matter addressing the constituents of the ANC Youth League. This is when he was still the president of the ANC Youth League. And what appears in the video, and which has been confirmed by Mr. Malema himself, is that consistent with his idea that when he confronts economic issues, land issues, it is not a fight directed at a particular demographic, say for example the poor. It's wider than that, it's not personal. He is prepared to fight his own organization for the same idea. He identifies where the issues are in terms of where he wants to go as a political party, which is the land redress issue. And he's identified the ANC has been part of that problem. That was the context. So what you see in the video, what he testified to, is that the suggestion is we will march to the union buildings, which is where President Zuma and his government sat as the executive. And we're going to ask for time frames because it's an agitation on the slow progress of land reform. That is why we're going to the union buildings. So that's the context of that video. We'll play the second part of it just now. Here across the road. So they think that no, if there's going to be any uprising, it will go to Union Building, huh? On our way. We will pass by. So we sort ourselves out properly. And then we can go to the city president and say, President Zuma, for sure you got a report about what happened in the Santi. So we just want some commitments and time frames. Because we know you were elected. Now just give us a time frame where when will you resolve this matter? And then on our way back, we'll also pass by the we are managing. Now, this video is quite important because it captures the idea, which was the witness's evidence, that there is a two pronged attack, as it were, to address the question of land. The one in the video is this idea of monopoly capital and the other is the ANC itself. Now, with that context in mind, from the witness's evidence, let's go back to what you said. <coughs> now, again, we've accepted on your testimony that you say, at the face of it, the song we just referred to, Malema, will the stick, the beating is coming, is a metaphor. And we've accepted that it's a metaphor directed at President Zuma and the ANC government. Now, the song was making a statement about the inadequacies of President Jacob Zuma and his ANC government. Is there a parallel between what we've seen and this assertion? I think you could see a parallel, yes. Yes. Do you want to explain that to us? Well, what the uh, speaker is saying there is that um, they're, going to, they're going to keep on protesting, they're going to march to the centers of power because they have something to say and they have a policy they want to put forward. And that seems to me that uh, that is a, a similar thing to what um, was being um, implied in the song. Yes. And then you continue to say, it's beating, and you put it in inverted commas, 
Why is beating in inverted commas? Um, what line is this, please, Mr. Kastitopo? Um, it's it the song was making a statement about the inadequacies of President Jacob Zuma okay. and his ANC government. Yes. The next line is, it's beating promised, and then yes. it's beating in inverted commas. Why is it in inverted commas? It's in inverted commas because it, it's not going to be a physical beating. Yeah. It's um, a, a statement about um, a beating in terms of we have beaten you in this race or this contest yeah. or this battle for for power, if you like. Yes. And then if you go to the very last paragraph, perhaps before we do that, on this idea that this song is not literal, I want to play a second video. And I want you to observe this video. the exact same song, 2016, not only has Oliver Tambo since passed on, Nelson Mandela himself, my apologies, former president Nelson Mandela himself has passed on. He has since been released, he has since governed, and when I say governed, he led the ruling party. But it's a song that's still being sung. Do you have a comment on that? I think it shows that a song exists in a wider frame of time and reference. And the song still carries huge weight as a historical st statement. And it shows how songs can move through time and cause inspiration through memory to a later generation because it is a later generation. That's a very important point. Let me understand what you say. You say the song, amongst other things, preserves a memory. In other words, it's not just a statement per se, could well be at a given point in time, but it can also serve as a memory as an, and as an inspiration. Is that the evidence? I think with, with that song, which, I mean, you, it would be quite nice if you could also say it in Kosa as well, for the sake of the media as well. But I think what, what the song is doing is it feeds into a very long body of songs about Oliver Tambo, you know, that were part of a particular moment of the political life of the country. Yes. 
Well, I'm reminded uh, by... Sorry, I beg your pardon. Which song we're talking to you say if it could be sung in Sikosa? Well, Teta. Oh, okay. Well, Teta no bota. I'm minded to, to do exactly that, uh, Professor. Perhaps let me do that then. The song in this concert is Oliver Tambo, Teta no bota, Akulu Mandela, as it was. And I've given the English translation. Now, let's go back to page 361. At the very last paragraph of that page, you say, in the case to hand, Song assisted Malema in his dialogue with the state. And you've already testified about that intersectionality between Mr. Malema's song and the state. It helped him to carve out new posi positions vis-a-vis -vis economic policy and the urgent question of the poor and the marginalized who were often the youth. What's the suggestion there? I think it goes back to the point that's one of the major points I'm trying to make in this, in this article, um, written, published in 2015, was that it opened up a space for economic policy and for, for him to, to make his mark as a politician who had, had something to say and had a position to take. He wasn't just uh, there for the razzmatazz. And then you continue and say, also the initial focus on the Dugulubun song meant that Malema was reconnecting with the deep stream of performance politics that ran like a current, at times unheeded, through national life. Do you care to comment what that means? I think it shows what, what I've been trying to argue then, what I've argued in other places as well, that um, political song has often played a part in public life, but it hasn't been fully realized that it is part of dialogue, it is part of a debate, it, is, it actually has a role as speech, it, and that you can't say that things, only, only things that are in print are the things that carry weight. There is a wider sphere of dialogue and debate, and that this is what is being entered into by this song. He's linking with older traditions of performance and rhetoric. Yes. Now, what I capture from what you've said is that this song allows space for dialogue. Do you perhaps have any writing of any sort that reaffirms that notion? Any writing in what sense? In other words, would you have had perhaps another example of another song that reinforces the idea that when it is being sung, it opens up space for debate? Well, I think the, 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 the song by Chief Albert Latuli that I put at the beginning of this paper, Tina Sizwe, is in Sundu, is an example of um, a very important um, intervention in, uh, by Chief Rituli in 1953 when he sings that song whilst he's making the last speech that he made before he was uh, banned and sent to, uh, had to stay in Grantville. And so the song there is part of his <coughs> ideal of land retribution. And this is something that is being picked up in, in this particular song, I think. Yes. That's why I link the two. Yes. And uh, the deep stream of performance politics, um, if you think, and I mean, if you think um, from 1910, when the ANC was founded, well, 1912, right through, song plays a part. The parts change because they tend to get more radical and more militant. They begin by being linked to Christian hymns, as that one is, uh, in its rhythm, 
da 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 da. But you know, later the songs become much more militant. You think of the funerals, you think of um, things like that, other rallies. It becomes rougher. That's what people like Anne Schumann say, and I think she's right. And Anne Marie Gray says the same thing as well. So there's this deep stream of performance politics, which is not sufficiently taken into account as part of what I would call the political domain in the widest sense. Yes. On that point, can I please draw your attention to page 378? <coughs> perhaps I apologize, my Lord, and I apologize, Prof. Ghana. Let's perhaps go to the start of the article at three seven five. Scroll down to the part where the lyrics of a song appear. Now, this article is the second article that has been discovered on behalf of the respondents. And the title of the article is Jacob Zuma, The Social Body and the Unruly Power of Song by Liz Ghana. Is this your article? It is. If you go to the middle, just after the abstract, <coughs> you see what appears to be lyrics of a song. Are they lyrics of a song? They are. The Zulu version of the song is Umshinwam, Umshinwam, Weba, Aulet Umshinwam. The English translation is My Machine Gun, My Machine Gun, O oh Father, please bring me my machine gun. Now, is this a literal or a metaphoric song? I think it's a metaphoric song. When he first sang it, Jacob Zuma did not expect somebody to come out in front of the court in 2005 where he sang the song and present him with a machine gun. What he was saying was um, an illusion to heroism, struggle, and what you use when you are in a position of having to fight for something. Yes. Let's then go to the page 378 I spoke about earlier. If you go to the middle of that page, where it says song, language, and citizenship, it says the presence of Umshinwan, once publicly performed by Zuma, became part of a widening consciousness of song as a catalyst for popular debate in South African public sphere. The discussions it triggered took place under trees, at bus stops, in taxis, shippings, coffee shops, <coughs> and bars, as well as in the electronic and print media. Do you care to comment about what you meant by that? I think what happened, uh, if we go back to 20, uh, 2005, was that the songs had to some extent fallen out of public life. It was understood um, quite widely, I think, that um, songs didn't matter anymore. They didn't have a place. They'd done their work in the liberation struggle. We were now in a new era, and um, songs were not as important as they had been. So what Zuma's song, Umshinu Wam, tells us is that there was, in fact, a way that song can connect with certain parts of the public that can, can feel cut out 
of an elite, an elite print discourse. And so that he was widening uh, the scope of the discourse, of the public discourse, and he was allowing ideas to come back and song to come back as something that had a place in public life. Yes. Forgive me if I went on too long. No, you did not. Thank you, Professor. Now, going back just, to... Just, the... just bear with me for my notes. You, 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 you mentioned songs and then you mentioned song. Just, just take me through that again. So um, I'm talking about song as speech or writing. In other words, song as a kind of collective no, no, noun. You, you were speaking about that the songs were brought back as part of the public discourse. Yes. So then you then move on to speak only about song. So you move from the generality to the specific, so I didn't follow up from there. Um, I apologize, my lord, I was getting carried no, no, away. Don't, don't worry, uh, I just am for my notes. Okay, thank you. You just want to explain that? Um, if you take a, a body of songs, you can talk about song. Song as an activity in the public domain, like you can talk about speech as an activity in the public domain. You can have speech and speeches, so, and then you can have song as the generality and songs as particular songs within that. I hope that's clear, my lord. Thank you. <clears throat> now, Prof Ghana, when we when I asked you whether the song is literal or not, you said it's not literal. Now, I accept that that is the idea of the song, at least that's your argument, that it's not literal. But if you look at the lyrics again, my machine gun, my machine gun, oh father, please bring me my machine gun. Is there no scope to suggest, outside of context, that this song is literal? Just reading the words cold without context. Well, if you read the words as words, um, the, it's quite literal, yes. Yes. But it's, but, it's not, it, it, it is a song, and it has a particular frame to it. Yes. Now, let's go back to the article we started on. And we were on page, in fact, I've exhausted that page. Let's go now to page 364. <coughs> now, at the second paragraph of page 364, in the preceding paragraph, and pages, which I will not read in the interest of time, but having set out how Julius Malema viewed the old ANC guard, in other words, the older generation. You had a fancier word for it, I just can't recall it. But the idea is the relationship between the young and the older generation. You had taken us through <coughs> what Malema's perception is of that old guard. Now I want to draw your attention to specifically paragraph two, the second paragraph, where it starts with the words, it was this configuration. And that's where I want to take you. Paragraph two on page 360. 364, the second paragraph, my lord, where it starts oh, with the I words, found, it I was found this. It. Thank you, I found it. There, Prof Ghana, you say, it was this configuration of power and its modes of rhetoric, one tied to a backward-looking nationalism, which Julius Malema set out to change. Let's stop there. What do you mean? I think what I, what, what I was doing there, what I'm doing in that piece, is I'm, I'm looking at the two songs, and I'm seeing that... Sorry, just, just so the court is able to follow and the public is able to follow, which two songs are you referring I'm to? I'm referring to Umshinuami and 
um, Thank you. Yes. And I'm thinking that the Mshinuami is coming out of perhaps a narrow view of nationalism um, that Malema is trying, through the song, is trying to shift. Yes. So in other words, if I understand you correctly, there is one prism which is embodied in the song Mshinuam by the old god personified by the former president Jacob Zuma. And then you've got this new prism which is embodied in the song Dubulipunu personified by Mr. Malema. Am I understanding you correctly? That is correct. Yes. I'm not saying, I don't say in this article, I don't imply that Umshiniwami might never be sung again. Yes. Because somebody else could take it up and do something else with it. Yes. Because part of what I say is that in the first article is that song is unruly. Yes. Nobody owns a song. Yes. So it could go somewhere else. Yes. So it's a question of adaptation. One might take a song from <coughs> yesteryears, find relevance of the song decades later, and give it its own meaning. Is that the suggestion? It's possible, yes. And I mean, that could be sh so with the Oliver Tambo tet tetano water. That could be used again in a metaphoric way. Yes. Because if we take it from a literal perspective, and it's a good example that you're taking us back to the Teta No Water song, because one would see it, and I can understand and appreciate one, why one would see it in a literal perspective. Because it's at a time when President Mandela is in jail, Oliver Tambo is doing the bidding um, for anti apartheid activism in, in Europe. And then what you have then is someone asking that Tambo does something about it. But now you're suggesting, if I understand you correctly, is that even though events have preceded the relevance of that song in a literal sense, it still finds expression to date. I am saying that, but I also think you could take that song and put new names in it. Yes. X, Teta, no Y. Yes. In order to Kulula, Z. Yes. So the songs can shift. Yes. And it can still have power because it is in the realm of political song and it's known. Yes. And then you go further. You say he did so through a new foregrounding of political song as part of a battle to challenge the power of the elders and of their right to own and produce the struggle past and through this, the new future. <coughs> I don't know if you're following my reading of the sentence. Yeah, you did say reproduce, did you? <coughs> no, uh, let me read the sentence again. You say, it's the second line of that paragraph I referred to. You say, so let me just start the whole thing so that it makes sense. You say, it was this configuration of power and its modes of rhetoric, one tied to a backward-looking nationalism which Julius Malema set out to change. He did so through a new foregrounding of political song as part of a battle to challenge the power of the elders and of their right to own and reproduce the struggle past and through this, the future. So I'm asking you to comment on that assertion. Well, I think it goes back to what I say in my abstract when I say that one of the things that uh, Malema and through the song Dubli Bunu is trying to do is challenge um, a gerontocratic elite. And Africa is full of gerontocratic elites yes. who control everybody else below <coughs> them. And they're usually men, I may add. Um, so uh, Malema is really saying, no, 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 no. I'm going to, I want to reproduce the struggle <coughs> past, look to the future, and see that there's a different relation between the struggle past and the future. Yeah, and then you continue and say he did so amongst a rise in poverty and a relative and disillusioned youth. Now, I think that's as clear as it can be, but what is worth flagging is 
the witness's testimony that when he testified that his fight of the system includes the ANC government, which was dead and must be emphasized by his own party, which he was the youth league president of. He says part of the struggle is to confront that system which we've alluded to now. And he's doing this for the benefit of the people that are re referred to here, amongst others. He did so amidst rising poverty and a resistive and disillusioned youth. And then he continues, there was also an increasing sense of media and digital power of sounds, words, and images which circulated within and beyond the country's borders and light at lightning speed. All this marked the times. I explore in the next section Julius Malema's political vision, which foregrounded a new push on land reform, a radical economic policy, and I show how song was a central component of this strategy. On that note, my Lord, it is now 11.23. Uh, perhaps this is an opportune time to take the tea break and resume afterwards. Yes, can we make it a bit shorter? Can we make it uh, 10 minutes? Thank you, ma'am. We're going to take a tea break. You will remain under oath. Thank you. The coach, <coughs>